Okay, let's let's get started. Um, first question I have is: um, Are there any questions or discussions about uh, the speaker last time? I don't know what people. Was there any reaction one way or another to the speaker? We had. Uh, there was a, I, I had. We did not. Last class last time was the lecture on um, cancer. Um, you know, bioinformatics and cancer uh, from. Uh, Chris Sanders, um, what was the reaction to this? Yes. Didn't understand. understand. Okay. How many people? How many people had the reaction? Um, again, no feelings will be hurt one way or another. That that I didn't understand this and this was a waste of time. Okay. I'm seeing uh, one. Well, two. I would say that the first part of that, not necessarily the second part. Okay. Let's start. Okay. Okay. Well, let's. Okay. Um, okay. So, how many, first of all, how many people felt that they understood part of it, uh, enough of it to make it interesting? Okay, I'm hearing one, two, three, four. How many people feel they did not understand it enough to make it interesting? More people. Okay, interesting. Okay, I'm a, I'm a little bit surprised, but it is informative to know that, actually. Um, any specific things that were confusing or... Uh, any reactions that we might want to discuss as to what it was, what bothered you, what you were confused about, um, why, uh, anything about that, anything you said that was interesting or confusing, or any discussion that might be illu you know, illuminating. Yeah. Okay, so you're overwhelmed by a lot of um, things you didn't know about. Okay. That's a fair. That's a fair reaction. Um, I mean, so part of part of it is a question of, you know, let's say what I think. Of, let's say what are valuable things about this course? Okay, one is I think that it is a good example of let's say how you start to get into an interdisciplinary study area. Okay, which is a world of taking a, a domain that you know nothing about and trying to learn something about it and put it into computational terms that you can see. That is what I consider to be one of the valuable things here, even if you're not going to grow up and become a biologist. But um, so was there anything in particular that was confusing or something that's worth discussing? Uh, okay. Like why he was doing it or anything like what it was. Okay. So there was a comment, a sort of a throwaway comment in there at the beginning about HIV being well, what it is, what, what, by that, what he meant was that uh, HIV is a disease that, you know, when it first emerged, it was this untreatable plague, and if you had it, you were, you were going to die, and that was the end of it. Um, now, you know, probably over the last, I will say it's about 15 years or so, they developed this multi-drug therapy that is basically turns HIV into a chronic disease, okay? So if you're as old as I am, and you know, you read the newspaper every day, you used to see people dying of HIV all the time. And you don't see that so much anymore, at least in the developed world, because there are drug therapies that involve more than one drug, okay, to combat the disease. And uh, that was basically what he was remarking about it. Um, the thing that I guess is interesting about the multi-drug idea is one of the reasons for it involves evolution, okay? And that's, uh, that maybe is one thing that's interesting. With cancer, cancer is a genetic disease. And, you know, what basically happens is you get a bunch of cells that are quite malformed, but they have the property that they grow quite rapidly. That's basically what, what a cancer cell is. And what happens is that if you have a drug that kills cancer cells more than regular cells, that's good. But often what happens is that, can, that, that, that the population will evolve to avoid the resistance, you know, to become, you know, if there's one particular drug that is killing these cells, the cells may very well evolve a mutation that lets them ad survive against this kind of a drug. And then basically within a certain period of time, you end up with a tissue sample that is, you know, you end up with a, a tumor that, you know, is still cancerous, is still going to grow, and is now resistant to what you, you know, the drug that was working. And so one of the ideas that they have is sort of, well, what if you give it multiple drugs at the same time, each of which are, are targeting cancer cells? It's harder to evolve a mutation against both of them simultaneously. 
you design something that's going to make it, you know, if you have a mutation that makes it more, one drug less effective, that cell will hopefully still be wiped out by the second drug and it won't come to take over the population. So that's one part of the subtext of what he's talking about. Any other questions or comments about anything he said in there that was interesting? Okay, interesting or confusing or bothersome? Okay. Some of the technology, again, the, the big picture here, but the, especially the first part of the talk, was about um, you know, how genetic information on lots of different cancer patients will enable you to start to try to identify what the main mutations are, what the main life cycle of you know, tumors as they, as they evolve are. Okay? And that's, I think, the stuff that's more clearly relevant to what we're talking about. Questions or comments about that? The idea basically is we're talking a lot here about sequencing. The truth is that by the time you guys are old enough to get cancer, your genome will be individually sequenced. Okay? And what he was basically talking about is at this stage we're trying to sequence enough cancer patients to study them to figure out what we will learn to help you by the time they're ready to sequence your genome. That's, I guess, the big picture. Any questions? Any questions? The second part of the talk, I guess, was dealing more with modeling questions. Again, we, ha we so far when we talk about the biology we've talked about, we've had this idea that genes make proteins. In fact, it's not like they're just lumps of things that you're just sitting around. These proteins interact with other proteins to turn on other proteins, to turn them off, to stick in complexes. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. That's why he was talking a lot about these networks of proteins. Remember at the, towards this, the second half of the talk, he started producing these graph diagrams, you know, vertices and edges, and said, hey, this protein interacts with the other. And there basically is this network of one protein interacting with another, which is important to understand how biological systems work. Again, if you want to um, disrupt some um, cellular mechanism, there's a bunch of different proteins involved. If you can hit the right one, maybe you can disrupt this mechanism, this pathway, this mechanism that is bad. Or maybe augment one that is sort of weaker than it should be. And that is, I guess, why networks and graphs and things like that on these, um, you know, these proteins basically are important. We may talk a bit more about, that. we'll talk more about proteins turning on other proteins and regulation and things like that um, later. But any questions about that? Any other questions? about the uh, talk or any other comments from there. Okay, I'd like to now conduct another lightning poll. Okay, it turns out that there are a total of three of the Lauper Center talks this semester that I think are interesting. Now, um, the, there happens to be one on Tuesday by a professor named Bud Mishra, who's a well-known professor of computer science, okay, at NYU. Um, his research interests over the years have actually been quite similar to mine, even though both of us have moved around fairly wildly. So if you want to think of me as Bud Light, okay, <laughs> that's not a terrible thing to do. Um, but, uh, but basically he's going to be talking here about algorithmic, it says certain algorithms of assembling genomes. So again, he's going to be talking here about, we've been talking about genome assembler. He's got some other um, issues of, he's built another assembler. He's got some other issues in this kind of thing. And so, the question is, do we move class on Tuesday to hear this guy speak, okay? And again, I'm going to conduct a, a, another lightning poll here. We can either have the class in here, and I go on, or we um, go to hear Bud Mishra speak. But, um, any questions about the stakes here? Yeah. What do we miss out on if we don't? Well, things slide. Things will, you will miss out on the stuff that I think is most missable in the middle of the semester, okay? Because, uh, you know, so basically I know you have a finite number of class periods. I will eliminate the stuff that I consider most expendable when I have to make those kind of decisions. Okay? Any questions about that? Any other questions about the stakes here? Okay? So we're now going to conduct a lightning poll here. Again, I promise not to look at you guys' face, okay, in the videotape. Um, who here would like to see us go to hear Bud Mishra give uh, the talk on um, assembly. Raise your hand if you would like to see us do that. And I'm counting on Paulina to add, um, add this up. And who here would rather we not have this in half class? Raise your hand. 
Okay, how many people said that? No one. No one. Okay, <laughs> so I'm glad to know how popular I am. Okay, so, uh, so, okay. so on Tuesday we will see Bud Mishra at, on, on the assembly again in the, in the uh, chemistry uh, 412. Is that good? Any complaints about that? Okay, good. Um, okay, so let's talk about that. The other um, logistical thing that I would like to hear us talk about are there any questions about um, what you go? Are there any questions about homework one? Okay. Yes. Okay. So there's a question here about are gene sequences uh, linear or sequential? Okay. I guess I would say uh, I mean, but, but linear or circular? Is that what you mean? Yeah. So the answer is, as in most things in biology, is it depends, okay? Most of genomic information that we talk about is arranged in chromosomes. For the most part, the answer is linear, okay? That, uh, that, that, that DNA sequences are in chromosomes, they're linear things, okay? In today's lecture, I am going to mention something. Um, Certain, certain things called plasmids, sometimes small pieces of DNA in cells are circular. And these are important things, like the, the genomes of mitochondria. These are like little organelles that sit in cells that help, you know, are involved in sort of energy regulation, metabolism within cells. And these happen to have small circular genomes, okay? So if I had to say um, in a typical cell, you know, I will say 99.9 percent .9 of the DNA, genomic DNA, is linear. There's a small fraction of it that is um, circular, but this is important stuff. There is some, there is important stuff. Yes. So when they're generating random fragments. So when you're doing your experiment, I would say deal with this case. Okay. There's no reason to what Mary about the complexity of dealing with uh, circular DNA. We'll talk a little bit about that today, I hope. But uh, yeah. Okay, so the answer was for problem four, there was an algorithmic problem. And you say you have an algorithm that takes order 2n steps. Well, it's actually 2n plus n, but I would just. Order 2n. The answer is is this the same as order n plus m? And the answer is yes. When we say order, the, this is the big, the, this is basically the big thing of saying we're going to worry. Ignore the fact that we go through things twice, three times, a hundred times. It basically is ignoring multiplicative and additive constants. So the answer is two n log n is n, two n plus m is n plus m to me. A hundred n plus m is n plus m to me. M times n plus m is not m plus n to me. Okay, that's the difference. Any questions about that? And again, if you're confused by this. In the uh, biology textbook, there is a description of, al you know, big O behavior, and you should be, you know, if you haven't seen that, you should definitely be looking at that. Yes. So problem three, uh, after we uh, do the sequencing by that program, B, yeah. uh, you ask what, what's the gaps in the original, what's the difference of gaps and accuracy in the sequence string? Okay. Okay, so now this is now an interesting question. So first, we've got this sequence that you generated. You fed it something, right? You slithered it up into chunks. You assembled it. And you want to now know how good a job you're doing, right? So one question is, well, you know what the right answer is. And you know what answers you've given it, right? So the key question is, how do you put your answer, if you put your answers back on your reference genome, the stuff between where it is are the gaps. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's think about it. You know what the right answer is, because your program, you know, you as the runner of the program know the an what the right answer is, right? You as the, ru the runner of the assembler knows what the answers that you got were. The real question is you've got to go and try to figure out where is it that these sequences fit on the reference genome. Okay? And that's really, I guess, the hard part about scoring it. Okay? 
in one sense, there should be a couple of simple ways to align it. We will be talking more about alignment later, okay? One possibility is that you find where the longest, let's say, a long match between this and that is. In fact, one thing to note is that for each one of these reads that you have, if you know where it was in the genome, you, when you get made your reads, you knew where it was, right? So that should tell you something about where you put it back. Does that make it sense? Either you could say, I don't know where it came from, in which case you have to align it and find the best place. And we'll talk more about algorithms for that. The other thing is to note that if you made up the data set, then darn it, you know where these things came from, right? Okay? And that should tell you, let's say, where your gaps are. Does that make sense? Okay. Again, do the best that you can. Rec I recognize that this is a two-week homework. I recognize that there's a small number of people. I recognize that in a group, I recognize that this is 5% of your grade. Do the best that you can to learn something from this. That's really what I am interested in. Yes? Okay, so when you use the assembler, you came back with an N. N is the, uh, not DNA letter, but the gen bank letter for none of, for don't know what it is. I know there's a base here, but I don't know what it is. Everybody get that idea? And of course, it's much more useful to put out an N than it is to put out a wrong, a, a knowingly wrong guess, right? It's much more useful to have a chunk of sequence with an N and another chunk of sequence right next to it, knowing that this is close to that rather than have two separate contexts, right? If there really is only one base difference, that's a good thing to know. So if you look at the GenBank database, they have an alphabet for A, C, G, and T. They have N. They also have letters for every subset of A, C, G, and T. So let's say you think it's an A or a C, but you don't know which one. There is a letter that sometimes gets omitted for that. Okay? Probably you don't have to worry about it, but recognize that, that that makes sense to have that in the sequence. Okay? In the database sequence. Any other questions about it? Yeah? Okay. The question is, what do you submit? You and your partner get together, produce one sheaf of papers. You staple them, and you write both your names on them. Is that understood? So I do not want to get two copies of the assignment, okay, with, with uh, you know, with, uh, one with your name on it and another with your partner's. It has to be graded twice. That's silly, right? Both of you write your name to it, and, you know, you will get the same grade. If for some reason your partner's been a complete louse and you want to <laughs> think on your partner, you, you can feel free to do so. But assuming you and your partner have worked together on it, you will get the same grade on it. Any questions? Yes. What? Groups of three are allowed. No more than three, I think, is probably re three is probably a good upper bound. Last question is uh, in the first two questions, it says write a one-page paper about your experiences, and we yeah. have a reasonable level of topics about for investigation. Right. So there are four subtopics under each of those questions. So is it necessary to cover only? You have one-page one paper. You have a one-page paper to write. You have one-page paper to say intelligent things about. Okay. So, so the intelligent things that you can say, say. Okay. And you know. You can only fit in one page, right? It's not required. It, it's not required to solve all parts uh, if you do a better job with your one page on some of the parts. Okay? Does that make sense? So you do an investigation. I don't want you to um, get overwhelmed by trying to figure out what I'm trying to do. There's a problem. Study it. Tell me that you learned one page of what you did and learned. Okay? And if you can't find one page that you didn't learn, then there's a problem. Okay? Yes? Should we submit it electronically? No, you should submit a sheet of papers. Okay? I print out, and these print out will be physically given to be graded. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay? Yes? Uh, okay, so you're saying that there's a problem with, with that the assembler sometimes tries to map reverse complements. And that is definitely true. So if you think about it, what are we doing here? 
in an assembly problem. You had your original genomic sample you wanted to, to sequence. You remember you made a lot of copies of it. You chopped them up in a blender, okay, and you started sequencing. It is not clear once you had your fragments whether they came from the top or the bottom strand, okay? So in fact, that is actually a problem that you, re you, you have in assembly, okay? Is that for the most part, you don't know that they're all from the same strand. You know that informationally, each piece is the same. Because if you had the original, the, the, the top strand, you can compute the reverse complement and vice versa. But you have the hard part that when you see one of these things, you don't know if it's on the top or the bottom. You're trying to reconstruct the top, okay, or the bottom. It doesn't really matter which. But the pieces you have do give you the problem that you don't know where they're from, okay? And so that's why it will probably try to convert these things into reverse complements sometimes and do things with them. Yeah. It's always red, right, so the reason why you have the reverse complement thing, our molecules are always red from the five prime end to the three prime end, right? And on this molecule, this is red from the five prime end to the three prime end. Does that make sense? And so, so that's why, um, you know, one thing that your assembler probably did is once you gave it a set of sequences, probably the first thing it does is it computes the reverse complement and sticks that in there too and hopes to assemble two copies of the thing. That's probably a good strategy for, the, for it, right? Because otherwise it doesn't know whether to use this reads or not. Yeah. Okay, so what you're saying is, hey, what I gave was all on the upper strand, okay? Why don't I tell the assembler to cheat, okay, and to say everything's on the upper strand? That, in general, is not the experimental situation. There is nobody looking at, when you're doing the data collection, there's nobody with a set of microscopic tweezers picking out the top strands when you chop the thing up in a blender. So for the most part, the answer is you don't know this thing. And so you could take advantage of this and, I mean, a realistic pattern generation would in fact generate stuff from both the top and bottom strand, okay? But if not, you can't expect, you know, it's not surprising if the assembler is fooled. It is sort of assuming that you're giving it double-sided data. And, um, you know, and, you know, then it's going to interpret it as, as that. Any questions? Okay. Any other questions about the assignment? Okay. One other question that I'm going to say, just as a quick thing, several people have come up to me um, on pro the last two algorithm problems and um, started talking to me about suffix trees. I'll just give you, you know, if you can make it work with suffix trees, that's fine. I have no idea how to do it with suffix trees. Those are the things I'll tell you right now. <laughs> so you think about it. It's not obvious to me that suffix trees are part of, of, of either of those problems. Okay. Maybe, conceivably, there may be a way I'm not thinking about it, but just so you know, that my thought of them is that they are basically, it is elementary algorithmics that I want you to use there. Okay? Any questions? Okay? Any other questions about the homework? Okay. So we'll see you in, um, in, in uh, what you call it, at uh, next class we will meet at uh, uh, Mishra's talk. Since we'll be at Mishra's talk and it's confusing to turn things in, I will let you have till th the Thursday class when we actually meet in here. And at the beginning of class, you can turn in the homework then. Okay? Does that sound fair? Is there anybody who objects to me doing that? <laughs> yeah, it's you. Uh, any particular? Oh, yeah. Okay, then get it done earlier and bring the paper in then. Okay? Uh, is there anybody, how many people have real objections, honestly, to me, 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 me not collecting them till Thursday? How many people had objections? One. One. Okay. I'm sorry about that, okay? <laughs> okay. Okay. Get it to me. Uh, get, if you want, get it to me early, and I'll, uh, I'll say thanks. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Now let's, let's get started with the real material again. Any, uh, actually, any other questions logistically or technically or anything like that? Okay. Good. 
Okay, so what I would like to now talk about our last class, again, we started, we talked a lot about the, the realistic uh, questions of assembly, and in fact, it sounds from the homework that lots of you guys are now getting into the issues that really happen in assembly. So this is actually <laughs> good. Um, but I want to talk about some of the algorithmic ideas that are in good assemblers. I don't know what uh, Bud Mishra will hear his, what his assembler is like on, on, on Tuesday. It wouldn't surprise me if underlying it you will hear one of the data structures a suffix tree or a suffix array. And so I want to talk about these data structures because these are very good, important string algorithmic data structures that are useful in critical and let's say sequence alignment, a large scale sequence mapping, assembly, okay? And they enable you to do a lot of algorithmic problems very quickly and very efficiently. Okay, they're really amazing things once you know how to work with them. And so I'd like to spend today talking basically about these data structures in more detail. Any questions so far? Okay, what I'd like to do is just review quickly what is a suffix tray? Actually, let's maybe now we'll go to the, uh, um, maybe we'll get rid of all this here just to start fresh. So what is a suffix tree? A suffix tree, as we talked about before, is a try, okay, meaning a, uh, basically a tree where, a rooted tree where there's a character associated with each edge, okay, and it was a, a try was a rooted tree on words where there was a root, a path from root to leaf representing each word in the input. Everybody agree with that? And the good thing about that was if you wanted to tell whether your word was one of the words, you just bop down the suffix tree. Okay? Comparing it character from character to the not from, to the try. You wanted to match a word. Is this word one of my words in my dictionary? You just went down from the try. And in time proportional to the length of the string you were trying to compare, you could tell whether it was in there. Any questions about a try? talked about that last class. We said that what a suffix tree was, was a try on a very special set of words, okay? Namely, you were given one input string of length n, okay? And what we did was construct the n different try, different suffixes of that string, okay? The whole string is a suffix of itself. Knock off the first character. Everything else is a suffix. Knock off the first two characters. So any place you would start the string anywhere and go to the end, that is a suffix. Okay? And what a suffix tree is conceptually, okay, is nothing more than a try on all the suffixes of a string. Any questions about that? Now, what made them good? Okay. The thing that made them incredibly powerful was that you could perform um, substring searches, not string searches, but substring searches. Okay. That if I wanted to know whether Z, Y, X, Z, X, Y is a substring of this particular input string, I know that. If I have all suffixes, if this is a, sub, a, a substring of the string, there exists a, pre, a suffix whose prefix is going to be zxy. Does everybody see that? If the string is somewhere in there, there is a prefix starting, a suffix, namely the suffix starting at the first character of our string, whose prefix is exactly the string that we want. So just searching in this try enables us to find whether any particular substring, every, any particular pattern is a substring of our string in time proportional to the length of the pattern, okay, independent of the size of the string. Once we built the suffix tree, to search for is Skeena in the suffix tree takes time proportional to S-K-I-E-N-A, 6, okay? Any questions? Okay, so this is a very, very powerful thing once you can build the suffix tree. Does everybody see that? 
Any questions? The other thing just to note here is that you can actually tell more than just whether it occurs. You could actually, in some sense, tell how many times it occurs. How many times does at YZ occur in the string? Okay? If we go down the YZ path and look here, we'll see that there are two leaves in the subtree defined by y, you know, defined by that path, right? Both of these suffixes that start with YZ, both of these are distinct suffixes that are, start with YZ. The number of leaves underneath the node tell you how many times that substring, basically the path up until that node, occurred in the string. How many people see what I mean by this? How many people are confused by this? Any okay? Any questions about that? Like I don't see why that is, or something. Yeah, it's about the thing, I think, uh, about the yeah. Wait, X Y Z. Is this what you mean? Yeah. X Y Z. Right. Yeah. So what are this should be X Y Z. We, we saw that last time, right? Actually, someone sent me mail to remind me to fix the slide someday. <laughs> okay. But uh, but what was the point? Y Z occurs twice in the string. Is that right? YZ at the beginning and YZ down here, right? That means that there are two different suffixes that start with YZ, right? So if we walk down YZ, if every suffix ends in a leaf, then there have to be two leaves underneath, okay, in the subtree that is rooted by where we got to by going down YZ. Does everybody see that? And so being able to count those number of leaves tells us how many times it occurred. Any questions? Okay, any questions about that? Okay, one thing that I did to make sure, just as a, a, a technical detail that I'm going to do all the time, I am always going to end my string with a unique character dollar sign. Dollar sign has the property it doesn't occur anywhere else in the string. Okay? And the reason for that is to ensure that every suffix, okay, gets its own leaf. Does everybody see that? Remember we had that funny case in the try, where if we had there, T-H-E-I-R and T-H-E, there was a, you know, an internal node that might represent the string. We have a unique character at the end. All suff all suff pairs of suffixes are going to split off, okay? So that's sort of the assumption I'm making. Any questions about that? Okay, fair enough. Uh, yes. When, when counting how many times uh, Y Z occurs? Yeah. Why do you use the second part in the string? Why not use the first part? X Y Z and then. Wait. So you're saying why is it that? If I want to count how many times YZ goes in, how would I find that out? Well, let's look. YZ cannot possibly be here. This is the X branch, right? Okay. This is the y, br Z br y branch. So, I mean, I sort of have a compressed representation here, if you think about it. Wherever there's not a division, not a branching in a node, I sort of collapse that into an edge, okay? But does everybody see that all strings starting with Y, all substrings starting with Y, are down this branch? All substrings starting with X are in here, and all substrings starting with Z are in here. Okay? So there's no ambiguity about where I go down if I want to find all instances of YZ. YZ has to be on the Y branch, and then if, if there's a, another branch there, that it's, once I'm at the Y node, I go down to the Z node. And then anything that starts with YZ is underneath this node. Any questions about that? Yes? So how do you know how to label you know, the, first, um, the first branch there? So why you know, YZ instead of YZX? Wait a second. So, um, so, say again what your question is. I'm sorry. For the first branch, uh, the top row. Top row. Wait, which, which top row are you talking about? This? Uh, so the top branches, so X, Y, Z, Y, Z, Z, dollar. 
Okay, this thing is... Okay, in the entire tree, note that for every one of these suffixes, there is exactly one leaf for it. Do you agree with that? Yes. Okay, so what's the question? <laughs> no, 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 I mean, that's, I'm trying to get it, not trying to be cute. Okay, so if you have the, if you take the tree um, to the right of that arrow. Yes. Okay, how do you know to have YZ instead of like YZX? How do you determine where to... Okay, so YZX. So the important point is, I think what I think, first of all, recognize that there was this mislabeling, X, Y, Z. Is that right? Yeah. Actually, I, I have a term, it really should be Y, Z, X, actually. X, Y, Z going down. But that's not the point. The point being that each one of these nodes in my tree, what is the representation of it? Essentially, it is a uh, pointer for each letter of the alphabet. There is an X pointer, a Y pointer, a Z pointer, and a um, you know, dollar sign pointer, right? So the root is represented by pointers to three trees. Actually, you have four different trees, right? And these are other nodes. And so if I'm looking for a YZ, I know it's got to be down the Y branch. I'm going to hit another one of these nodes that's going to have a Z path. That's how I found it. Okay? Any questions? Any questions about how this thing works? Okay? So the great thing is I can find sub I can find um, substrings and time proportional to the size of the substring once I build the tree. Yeah, question. So when we build the tree for the first time, uh, do we build it in reverse? Like you start from the okay. and question of how do you build the tree? Our purpose is you go to a, an algorithms book and you find how to, a, a suffix tree building algorithm. You implement it you download the code from the net and you run it on your string. That's how you're going to build the suffix string. Okay? Well, actually, let me be a little bit less glib. The trivial way to build it, if you say, I need to know a way to build a suffix tree, it should be clear that you can build a suffix tree exactly the way that you built a try. Remember last class we talked about how you build a try? You have a bunch of strings you want to insert. You walk from the root, you insert another one by walking from the root. The moment you get a branch that you haven't used before, you insert other, you know, the nodes corresponding to the rest of the suffix in there. So if your answer is, how can you possibly build one of those? It should be clear that if you knew how to, if you understood how to build a try, you know how to build one of these. Does that answer your question? Okay, the question is, how do you choose which prefix it is? Note that, I mean, again, I'm not sure I understand exactly. When you're building a try, uh, what, what's the question? I think what some people might be missing is the fact that there's nodes on the XYZ branch for each of those letters. Nodes on those XYZ branches. Uh, on the XYZ branch, there's nodes going down. If you just have it... Okay, so the question is, okay, maybe this makes it easier for you. Okay, does it make it easier for you to think that there are these hidden nodes, okay, that I'm not talking about, that I didn't show, okay? You're 100% right that there are, if we think about these as tries, these hidden nodes. Does everybody agree with that? Now, these nodes are not so interesting because they only have one thing going in and one thing going out. Does everybody agree with that? That's why I didn't show them. Okay? So that may be the question that you're answering. And if so, that's a good question and a good thing to see. Okay? So my picture here is not strictly a try of suffixes. I did a little bit of a compression here or a hiding of things, right? Okay? Turns out, though, I did that for a very good reason. Okay? What is the... Um, what is... So let's think about this, though. I'll talk about what my reason is in a minute. Okay? So what is... Um, let's just try to go to the next slide. Next. So the question is, how much space does a suffix tree, try, tree take? Okay? Obviously, the time that it built, it costs to build it, 
is at least the amount of memory that it uses. If every operation writes one chunk, one thing to memory, if you use a quadratic amount of memory, then darn it, you're going to be using a quadratic amount of time to write that stuff. Does that make sense? So the first question is, how much memory does it take to build a suffix tree? Okay? In the worst case, I want to claim that it, sh it should be clear. How, how many, if I have a string of length n, and I go and implement that, and I have all these explicit nodes and things like that, how many nodes or characters will I have as a function of the size of my string? Okay, someone with that. I think I hear the word squared, quadratic. Okay, does everybody see that there is a danger here? Okay, that this is going to be a quadratic sized tree. Would it always be a quadratic sized tree? Yes. You say yes. I say the answer is no. no. What would be an example of a string where it wouldn't be quadratic sized? Right, if my string was A, 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 maybe I'll, I'll have a, a dollar sign here at the end, right? What would the suffix tree of that look like? There is going to be a long path of A, 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 and there's going to be a dollar sign off at every branch. Does everybody see that? So that is not a good example of a, th th that is an example of a string where, in fact, it would only take a linear amount of space. How many people see that? Okay, good. Okay. Now, though, suppose my string was a random string. Okay, what would happen in a random string? It starts to get pretty quickly. It would be unlikely that this particular substring had occurred previously. Okay, in my string, right? The only time I get to share nodes is when I have a substring that shares the content that, that this is, is, is a duplicate of something that was already in the suffix string. Is that right? So if my string was a nice random string, very, very quickly what would happen? We would expect, okay, that very, very quickly I would have, um, you know, all my, my suffix is going to branch off. Every new one suffix I insert and that's going to mean that there's going to be a long tail where there's no branching. And so each one of these words is going to have characters would explicitly have to be represented. I claim that what you would end up getting is almost all of your n strings will have at least, let's say, let's say at least half of your strings will have almost half the characters in this long tail not being shared some kind of an argument that at least, let's say, n squared over 4, or something like that, nodes are going to be needed in the tray. Okay? Any questions? Does everybody see that if we represent a random string like this, it will take up quadratic space? Okay? And that is a bad thing, because quadratic in the size of the human genome is more memory than you have on your PC. Any questions? Okay? Now, the amazing thing about a suffix tree, though, is that you can represent a suffix tree of any string in linear space. Okay? And this is an amazing thing. It involves two clever ideas. What are the ideas? Anybody see any ideas here? How we might get away not actually listing nodes for every single character in this. Yeah? When you have. <coughs> Okay, so let's look at over here. You guys were complaining a few minutes ago that I didn't explicitly show these nodes, right? It was confusing if you were expecting a try, and that's true. But there is one thing that is kind of neat. Suppose, let's say, that the string consisted of a million characters of a random string followed by another million characters. Let's say it was the Gettysburg Address followed by the Gettysburg Address. You know, four score and seven years ago, our fathers, dot, 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 four score and seven years ago, our fathers. 
we're going to have an edge, a, a long stretch of things where F O U R space S C O R, right, is going to appear, right, without any branching in between. I claim that rather than represent it by a long chain of nodes, we can represent that entire string by two integers. What are those two integers? What if we represent it by where it, uh, where it occurred in the original string? Here's x, y, z, right? That's a long node. What if I represent x, y, z by the numbers 1 through 3 and tell you that what this is is, sorry, okay, get rid of this thing. Okay, good. Suppose I represent the string by 1, 3, and let that denote you know the original string. The string that I'm interested in to label this edge are the characters 1 through 3 in the original string. Does everybody see that? If I have the original string stored up in memory, now then I claim I can represent any substring of it by just specifying a starting index and an ending index. Does that make sense? So what's neat here is even if I do have a suffix tree where I've got a long, you know, a, a long place where there is no branching, maybe a million characters, I could represent that simply by the starting index and the ending index. Okay? Two integers that point into the original string and say that the label from here to here are the characters between there and there. Any questions about that? How many people see the idea? How many people don't see the idea? This is a very clever idea. So now, I don't have to re represent um, long runs of strings. Okay? Any questions? Each edge in my suffix tray is going to represent basically by two integers. So the storage I need is the number of edges in my tray times two integers. Okay? Any questions? Now, how many edges will be in a suffix tray, which I have so compressed like that? This is the second very clever observation. How many edges or how many nodes in this tray will I have if my string, original string was of length n? Okay? Any idea? Well, let's remember something that, that, that we learned in graph theory or data structures. This is a tree that is a rooted tree. Is that right? How many leaves does this rooted, does, 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 does this rooted tree have? I built a suffix tree on n characters. How many rooted tree, how many leaves will that tree have? I heard n or n plus 1. Did I hear a bigger number? No, the number of leaf nodes in the tree. How many leaf nodes will I have? N. n Maybe n plus 1 if I add another character to be my end of character thing, right? Why is that? Well, each leaf node represents a suffix. How many suffixes are there in a, in a, in a string of n characters? n. Does everybody agree with that? So we only have n leaves. Does everybody buy that? The total size of our tree is going to be the number of leaves plus the number of internal nodes. Does everybody agree with that? And how many internal nodes are there if there are n leaves? See, n divided by 2. I want to claim at most n if they all branch at least twice. Note that if I am allowed a skinny twig, if my tree looked like this, ka-chunk, 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 right? 
with no branching. Here I've got one leaf. How many internal nodes do I have? As many as I want, right? But if I have a tree that is a binary tree, has it, every node has at least two children coming out. How many internal nodes must I have? If I want to have an internal node, I need at least two things under it, right? If this is an internal node, I need at least two things under it. Eventually, I'm going to stop. And if you look at this thing, in order to have n leaves, I had n minus 1 internal nodes. Does everybody see this? So the interesting thing is the number of internal nodes in any binary tray is one less than the number of leaves, right? And so what did we do? We can shrink this tree from, instead of being n squared in space. The first thing we do is remove any internal nodes within degree 1 and out degree 1, without, with, without degree 1, right? Because that can be compressed away, and we're better off representing the chain of those by just pointing into the string, right? What we're left with are nodes that are at least two nodes, you know, degree 2, and therefore if you've got n leaves, you have at most n internal nodes, okay? So what is the cost to represent the suffix tree? We have to pay n for the cost of the string. We need an array of characters storing the string. We need n leaf nodes representing the suffixes. We need at most n internal nodes. Okay, Each one of these nodes is of constant size if the alphabet is of constant size, right? It was something that had a constant number of pointers going out, right? And it also had, two, each edge had two integers telling you the starting and ending point where that string was going to be, uh, the substring that that F implicit in this edge is labeled, right? So I claim that there is n characters for the string, two n nodes, okay, in a node sense, each of which is going to have a constant number of pointers plus two integers at each, at each pointer telling you what the start and end characters are in the original string that the path implicit in that edge represents. If you give all that, you now see that the suffix tree can take up constant space, linear space, okay? And you get a suffix tree that is compressed and looks like this. Not like a try of suffixes, but a nice compressed, sorry, a nice compressed suffix tree that takes up linear space and has all the power of the suffix tree that we talked about. How many people see why it's linear? How many people don't see why it's linear? Any questions about that? So this is an amazing thing, so long as we believe in the big O notation. In the same space it takes to represent the string, or a constant amount more that times th that size. We can represent this amazing suffix tree index, okay? And be able to, what, once you have built the thing, you can now search in constant time. Any questions about that? Okay, so this is an amazing thing, okay? And, and we should respect this. Okay, so just to summarize everything I said, okay, we can store it in linear space by collapsing the degree one nodes into paths and paths into references to the original string. We could still build this thing. If we built this thing in an incremental and search way, it would still take quadratic time to build it in the worst case, okay? So we don't seem that we've done anything except that there are amazing, powerful algorithms that not only store the thing in linear space, but actually can build it in linear time, okay? I don't want to go through these because they're somewhat complicated, and we can use them as a black box. But you should now believe suffix trees are useful for searching. You should believe that you can store them in linear space. And you can believe that some smart people have figured out how to actually build it in linear time. 
So basically, it is a quite a reasonable thing to build a suffix tree. And this is what I was trying to mean when I misunderstood your question. If I had to build a suffix tree, I can go over the way, I can go into Google and type suffix tree implementation, and I will go to a place where there will be C code or Java code to build suffix trees, okay, in linear time and linear space. Any questions? Yes. Uh, we'll take the last part of the first sentence. Okay, by that what I mean is that in the original tree, remember, the problem we had was that there was a simple path where there was a long path of nodes without any branching point. We wanted to reduce the size of this thing, right? Each one of these nodes had a letter associated with it before, remember? A, B, B, A. Okay? That represented a substring in the original string, A, B, B, A. So what I'm going to do is now replace this in my news compressed suffix tray. Just one edge, not that whole path. And the labels on that path I need to store. I'm going to say this was in the 13th position in the string, 14, 15, 16. Just say that this is in positions 13 through 16. If I want to find out what those characters are, what am I going to do? I store my string. You want to find out what the first character is to search? It's in spot 13. Okay. Oh, it's an A. That's interesting. Okay. What's in the next character? It's in spot 14, 15, 16. Okay. A, B, B, A. Is that your question or what's your yeah, question? I mean, down there is no A, B, B, A. There's no ABBA in the tree, but there's an ABBA beside the tree, okay? There is the string, so what do I need? I need to keep the string, and I need to keep my compressed suffix tray. Between them, I have every bit of the information that I had in the original suffix tree. Everybody agree with that? That's what you can see. It's all there, and in constant time, I can get at it, right? If I want to know what this character is to match, is ABBA a substring? I know that here is a node. I know that it's starting with character 13. 13 is an A. Is A the first character of the string that I'm looking for? If so, fine. If not, it's not here. I've got to look down another branch, right? Or there may not be a branch for it, okay? Any questions? It depends about the exact way I organize my nodes internally. You know, there's a lot of constant equivalent ways you could do that. Okay? Any questions? So the suffix tree is an amazing and an amazingly useful thing. Any questions about it? You can build it in linear time. You can store it in linear space. You can now search in constant time, in time proportional to your pattern length. Is your pattern there? Any questions? Okay, so you should definitely understand suffix trees to that level. Any questions about that before I go on? The other thing, though, that's amazing about suffix trees, okay, is that you can solve a lot of other algorithmic problems with them efficiently, even without, you know, which are not about searching for a particular pattern. Okay? The same way. So now we agree we can use it as an index. So if you tell me, oh, I want to be able to store uh, the human genome, and I want to quickly answer whether a, a particular subsequence is in the human genome, build a suffix tree of the human genome, you can do that. Okay? But a suffix tree can do more if you think about them in the right way. And so what I want to try to now show you are three different algorithm problems where you can use suffix trees in clever ways to solve them that seem impossible without them. Okay? So the first one is a problem called longest common substring. Okay? I give you as input two strings, let's say livestock and sea liver. And I want to find out which string, what is the longest string that is a substring of both of them. In this case, it's live. Okay? Because live is a substring of both of them. There's a string of length four in common. Okay? Can someone 
without a suffix tray. Let's say, give me an idea how you might do this problem. Okay, I now give you two strings. One is of length n, one is of length m, and I want you to find out what is the string in common between the two of them that's longest. Yes? Dynamic programming. So dynamic, we'll, we'll talk more about dynamic programming later. So I don't know if I want to completely do it. You want to say live, stock, and C liver. What you're saying is that there is a point in this string i, here i equals 1, and a point in the other string, here number 5, okay, that there would be a string in common here. So you're right. One way you could do it is with something like Smith Waterman algorithm we'll talk about later, which is a dynamic programming algorithm. If you did it that way, it would be order n times m. Okay? Is there a simpler way to do it without such magic? Okay? Let's think about it. Is there, how else would you solve this problem? Okay? Is there any other kind of an algorithm you might use for this? Okay? Given two strings, try to find a common string between them. Okay, now you're giving a magic, the magic, okay? But as far as a simple way to do it, what else might I, anything you will come up with, I claim, there are a couple of different quadratic ways you could do it, right? Possibly, what if we build a suffix tree on one of these strings, okay? That would take n time, is that right? Okay. How could we use the suffix tree of C liver to help us find the longest substring that matches? Anybody give an idea about that? How would we do it? Let's think about this. Suppose I built a suffix tree on C liver. I could now start and look, walk down it from root down on live, right? L I V E S uh, it bombed off, right? So I've got a match of length 4. Now let me start from the second one, right? Does everybody see that? I, F, E, I, V, E, S, uh, that was a match of 3. Does everybody see that? If I could do those matches in constant time, it should be clear that once I have built, spent n time to build the suffix tr uh, tree of C liver, okay? I could now walk down it from each position in the other string. If there's m characters in the other string, each walk will take at most m steps, right, till it bunks off the, you know, till it bunks off the bottom. There's m spots. Each takes m steps. That would give an m squared algorithm. How many people see that? How many people don't see it and want to see it? Okay. So based on this, there's a couple of other naive algorithms. But back in 1970, Knuth, no less a man than Knuth, thought this problem did not have a linear time algorithm. How many people have ever read Knuth's books in here? Okay, some of you are aware. It was an al the, you know, the, the primal algorithm god is a guy named Don Knuth. And he wrote a wonderful series of books which sadly people don't seem to read anymore. How many people, re how many people read them? Okay, how people did not read them? Okay, you should go and read Knuth's books. Okay, they're still wonderful and relevant. But he thought this problem did not have a linear time <coughs> algorithm. But he thought this three years before suffix trees were invented. It's actually a very easy solution, okay, using suffix trees. Not easy, but a clever, you know, quite understandable solution. The idea here is, as I think you were starting to mention, Okay, what if I build one suffix tree containing the first string, where I build one suffix tree on a string, okay, where my string is the first input, which I think was livestock, a pound character, which is a character which doesn't exist in either of the strings, and then the second string, which was C liver. Right? Does everybody see this? My string is going to be C liver or livestock, pound C liver. And maybe I'll put a dollar sign at the end of it and build a suffix string, right? 
This is going to be interesting. If I build a suffix tree on this string, what is going to be interesting about the node lot, the, the path from the root that goes L I V E? Okay. Live, remember, is one that is in the first string and in the second string, right? What is interesting about that? What do we know about the node live? Yeah? So what you're saying is here that what, what's important to see here is that in that suffix tray, there will be a suffix tray. Somewhere around there is a path for live, L, I, V, E. And below that are a bunch of other leaves, right? The important question is, if I have two leaves, one of which is from the first part of the string, and another leaf which is from the second part of the string, then that means that this string is in both the first part and the second part. It means that we're done. Does everybody see that? So what are we going to do? We're going to build a suffix tree on these strings. And in each node in the internal thing, keep track of basically what the nature of my children are below it. OK? Remember, each one of these Positions, suffixes, remember, was a position in the original string, right? 1 through n, that's n plus 1, n plus 2, dot, 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 n plus m. The test of whether a node here corresponds to a string in the first part and a string in the second part is whether it has one child with one um, leaf with the starting position 1 through n, n and another one from n plus 2 to n plus m, right? Suppose I now do a depth first search traversal of this tray, right? It's a tray. Those of you who took an algorithms course know about depth first search, okay? Those of you who didn't, I understand that I'm patient, okay? My claim is I can walk through my tray, look at each node leaf, and now when I go back to the internal node, say that yes, if this leaf was this leaf was either in the first or the second half of the string, right? I can tell in constant time by the number of what suffix it is, whether it's from the first or the second half, right? When I do a depth first search, I will label this node with, do I have a, a leaf under me which is from the first or second half? The one that I want is the deepest node from the root that has both a left descendant and a right, a first half descendant and a second half descendant. And I claim that by properly labeling the tray, the root nodes of the tray, okay, I can tell that in the course of a depth first traversal, which is literally size of the tray. Okay? How many people sort of see it? How many people don't sort of see it? This one may be confusing. Okay? Any questions? Okay? Again, let's look at the example here. Maybe let's go back to the uh, previous one. Let's maybe look this for, since I, it's probably good to have a, a picture of a tray. What if, let's, let's see if we could fake it from the previous uh, one that we have, previous, previous, previous. Here is a suffix tree, right? Suppose, let's say, that our string was, um, our two strings were, um, let's say, x, y, z. Let's say our strings were x, y, z, x, and um, X, Y, Z, right? Which one of the leaves come from the first half of the string and which one of the leaves come from the second half of the string? For the first half one, 
This is one. This is one. This is one. This is one. Does everybody agree with that? For the second half one, those are nodes five and six. Does everybody agree with that? Seven is not interesting to me. I'm not going to bother coloring it, right? Now what I want to do is to find what is the deepest node in the tree. Oh, actually, excuse me. I guess I should erase this. This is, I think, not what I want. No, four. Yeah, yeah, right. X, right. No, this is right. Uh, four, this, four is still in the first one. I'm sorry. What I want to now know is... What is the deepest node in my tray, which has a descendant below it that is red and one that is red and one that is blue? Yeah? Why are the other dollar signs blue? Blue means, so here what I'm assuming is I'm going through my algorithm where my two inputs were. One was the string x, y, z, x. The other was z, y, z. Is that clear? Okay. Now, when I concatenate the string together and build the suffix string, that's what I've done here, right? The red ones are the suffixes that correspond to the first string. This one, that's red. This, the blue ones are the ones that correspond to this. I guess I should make it blue, right? Okay. Uh, what I have are not red dollar signs and blue dollar signs. The important thing that what I have here are I have red suffixes and blue suffixes. Note that the suffixes here, this was the number 1, 2, 3, 4, right? The red ones all corresponded to the suffixes from this, 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 and this. The blue ones corresponded to the suffixes from this and this make sense? See, there's four red ones and there's two blue ones, right? What is the longest string in common between the two of them? I want to find what is the deepest node measured by number of characters that has both a red thing under it and a blue thing under it, right? This is nice and deep, okay? But what's the problem? The children here are red I propagate this up on a depth first search, all I've got underneath here is red. Does everybody see that? If I propagate my children up over here, here I've got red and blue. Does everybody see that? And this tells me, oh look, I've got red and blue, and I've got a string of length two that does that, right? Here is another place though where it is red and blue. This one only has a string of length one labeling it, right? So what is the deepest place? The deepest place is over here, and YZ is the longest string in common between this and this. Does everybody see that? This is actually, I think, labeled effect. I'm going to blow this up. I kind of like this example, right? Let's say zoom. Let's see if I can figure this out. Zoom. Oh, um, I don't think it'll let me zoom. What do I have to do? No, 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 no. If I close it, I lose my markings. <laughs> so I can't zoom in on it with my markings. I'm okay, you have to see this now. Any questions about this? I think this should now be clear. And so if it's not clear, I'd like some questions. Any questions about that? So basically the idea is I build one suffix tree with both strings in it, okay, which takes linear time. I then will do a depth first search of the tree and propagate up the colors, okay, namely is it from a first half node or a second half node to each node. In the course of the upward traversal back, I will find what the longest common string common to both of them are. Any questions about that? Yes. How did I determine that a leaf, whether a leaf was red or blue? Yes. The answer is by its number. Okay. 
Each leaf, remember, I mean, I've now obscured it, but I don't know if you can still see there's numbers written under these things, right? They correspond to suffix 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, right? So which are the suffixes from the first string? The ones from 1 to 4. Right? And why are they the numbers 1 through 4? Because the, string, the first string is of length 1, 2, 3, 4. Right? So basically, based on just the numbers of the, the suffix, the number defining the suffix, immediately tells me whether it's red or blue. Right? And I just have to propagate that up to the internal nodes to get what I want. Any questions? Question? Yeah. Third node from the bottom right. Does that mean this one? This one? This one? Well, what is the number here? This number I thought was number three. This was, remember, again, if you look at my drawing, remember, I'm still missing, as I always have been, X, Y, Z, right? What? It's length 5, but that meant that it started from over here. This is the suffix that's represented by this node. This node is a leaf, right? The representation of the path is the root to leaf path. Okay, yeah. The pound sign is really just to actually just decorating. The, wind, the pound sign is not anything I've done here. I can do without the pound sign. Okay. But you cannot promise that one edge is going to exclusively. Oh, okay. So what was the reason for the pound sign? The reason for the pound sign was to make sure I didn't have any string that was in common that straddled the pound. That is really what I'm trying to avoid, right? The reason for the pound sign in my original construction is I didn't want, it would have been a bad thing if I said XY was the most common, was the com string that was common to both of them, right? Because that straddles the boundary here. That's not a real string in either of them, right? By putting the unique pound, that's how I prevented that from happening. That's why I found in my other construction. But in this particular example, I believe everything works out fine. Okay? Any questions? Okay, yes. So, so to No, to find the longest, I'm now going to walk down the tree. I'm doing depth first search on this tree, right? What does depth first search do on a tree? Um, if you do depth first search, what happens? You visit everything, right? Ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk. Remember depth first search? Okay. I'm visiting the entire tree. What is the depth in characters? as I get down here. Well, this node is, this, this particular edge, remember, was specified by two integers. Here, let's say it was four, 4 through 6. 4 minus 6 plus 1 is 3, right? This meant that down here I was three characters deep. Does everybody see that? So I'm going to do the traversal. In constant time, I can figure out how many characters deep I am from knowing the bounds on the label, okay, and subtracting them. Okay, does that answer your question? So you're just doing that first search going through the um, branches that have the longest, longest Going through the branches, looking at every node. I'm looking, in the tra first traversal, I'm looking at every node in the tree, right? The one that I want is, the one that is, is, is what I'm dreaming of, is the one that is longest, deepest, yeah. <clears throat> from the root in terms of characters that has two children underneath it of different colors. And that I claim I can figure out in a depth first search. On the way down, I label each node by how deep it is. On the way up, I tell me, do I have two children underneath me of different flavors? Okay, different colors. 
So I propagate that. You know, I, I, I now know that I've got a common thing of this de depth, okay, from both strings. Common substring from both strings. And I want the one that is biggest. Any questions? But I'm looking at all of them and just taking the biggest one. Any questions? The neat thing is I'm doing that in linear time. Any questions about that? Okay. Any questions? Okay. So we've done. A, okay. So we've gone through that carefully. I want people to understand that. That's a good one. Let me just try one more. Okay. And I'm going to skip. I think the second one. Actually, I'm gonna, let me just describe this problem. And I may or may not go through the algorithm more carefully. Okay, you can read through it. Let me just, since I've got a few minutes, let me talk about another problem you can solve this way. Okay? And uh, maybe, actually, maybe I'll go through it again later. But let's just talk about it. It has to do with finding palindromes. What is a palindrome? Okay, in a string. A palindrome is a string that reads the same forward and backwards. Everybody remember that? My favorite palindrome is a man, a plan, a canal, Panama. Okay? If you read through this thing, right? Panama, right? A man, a plan, a canal, Panama. Right? Does everybody see that? Does anybody else have a favorite palindrome that uh, they use? Okay. So palindromes are interesting things in English. But turn out that be very important in biological sequences. Okay? We've said something, but, but not exact palindromes. A palindrome.